the there's a hypothesis for an alternative explanation, which was or which is we were just completely oblivious when we were undergrads. Mm -hmm. Like stuff happening in the world is constant. But for some reason, it feels like it's much more acutely felt felt now or everyone's more aware mm -hmm. or maybe just just generation of students are more um you know aware of social issues than than previous generations and i've heard that about gen z before that that gen z and millennials before them are are you know more progressive than previous generations and also more like um um, woke. <laughs> into and yeah more woke more more into activism um more educated in terms of identity politics and things like that um and you know when i read these things i'm like yeah that that rings true to me i totally i totally can believe that they are more <laughs> woke than my generation um and I guess that's comforting in a way because it means that I wasn't completely oblivious when I was an undergrad, right? <laughs> but like, <laughs> but at the same time, it's just like, uh, it's good. I mean, I, I, if that's true, then then that's hopeful. That's a, that's an optimistic interpretation, I think, because it means that these new new students or these new adults um, who are going to take charge of their world eventually, um, you know, like we we. Sh I, I feel like, I mean, my values are in line with a lot of progressive values. I feel like um, as the generations uh, pass, we'll go more and more progressive with our values and everything as a country and stuff like that as a society. But <laughs> at the same time, like, I don't know if that's true, right? Like, um, I'm in Seattle, right? <laughs> and it's kind of a bubble here. Um, one of the most progressive cities in the nation. Um, you know, everywhere I turn, I, my neighbors basically feel the same way as I do. And I I know this isn't true if I was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I see like my students like aware of a bunch of issues and everything. But like, if I was teaching, you know, at some other university, would that still be true? I have no idea. It's interesting for me because I, when I first started teaching, I was teaching at St. Cloud State University, which um, uh, there was actually a fair amount of diversity, mostly actually from our um, international students. St. Cloud actually has one of the largest um, Somali populations as well. There's also a lot of Islamophobia. Um, and and racism in St. Cloud so it's and we've ha we've had a lot of we've had representatives who are extremely racist sexist homophobic you name it um so it's it's like this kind of clash of like trying to um trying to have more progressive conversations while also sometimes you're teaching students who come from very, very small towns who are completely like isolated from any of those conversations. So um, teaching at St. Cloud State was very, very different from teaching at Indiana University Northwest, um, kind of similar to Michigan State where it's a predominantly white institution. Um, so there's a, it's just a very, very different. Um, sometimes you, it's, it's a little bit scary how how many students might say something like, oh, I'm not political at all without realizing what that really means to, to you know, what, what politics are really involved with or how politics affect their lives. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, and it's, I don't know, when I think about my own undergraduate, it's, I feel like depends on who, <laughs> what your degree was and things like that too but um in terms of the news I feel like there's been so much more conversation about these things than there was when I was an undergraduate so when were you an undergraduate 
early, early mid nineties, I'd say. Yeah. Okay. So like, you know, there were protests of, um, the Bush administration and then we got into the Clintons, um, I don't, my undergrad isn't a good example I don't think or I mean so maybe I was oblivious because I feel like uh, when I think about my fellow students when I was an undergrad a lot of them probably were pretty uh, active uh, pro um, protesters and stuff um, so I went to Reed College so Reed College is, is you know I I would consider it probably, you know, if not the, then one of the most liberal colleges in the country. Um, one of the most, um, yeah, you know, we have sizable number of atheists and communists going to read. Um, I mean, it's our, our unofficial school motto is um, atheism, communism, and free love. So, oh really? Wow. Mm -hmm. um, and it totally shaped me. Uh, my undergrad years totally shaped me and my values and everything. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. So at the same time, though, like we could say all this, but I worry about my students um, and I feel like some of them have no idea what's going on. Um, and no sort of like natural inclination to stay informed, right? Mm -hmm. Or to to get informed. Like it isn't <laughs> if you're just living your life, it isn't something that that you um, um, it, like if you haven't been like if you if you don't have parents or whatever who've been sort of instilling those values in you or whatever, and you're just living you're just living your life. It's not like you're making a point to watch news and stuff like that, right? Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Actually, this is totally on the side, but I wonder if more uh, people in their 20s these days are more woke now because they get their news from like Facebook and social media and stuff. Whereas when, when we were in college, you had to deliberately read a newspaper or watch like the five o'clock news. You know what I mean? It isn't just like, you're not just, inundated with news 24 7 and you True. like you are now like now it's just like you just can't avoid it like if you are on Facebook then you just can't avoid news yeah I was thinking so I when I was an undergraduate which was like 2004 to 2008 somewhere in there Facebook came along but I don't remember as and I joined it pretty pretty early as it was kind of becoming popular um, but I don't remember seeing kind of like the nature of what people was posting was mainly like pictures of themselves <laughs> doing the duck lips and all that no it, there was wasn't as much even um post of political nature or or as much news but maybe it was maybe i wasn't following them i don't know so yeah now i feel like if you if you have a friend who's like um really informed then you're you yourself are probably going to be informed as well because yeah, yeah you're their friend right Whereas yeah. um, back then, so a little bit with your time, but especially with my time in the 90s, um, you know, news came from specific news sources at specific times during the day. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that meant that just a lot of people were disengaged and just not consuming that news, you know, um, unless they had cable. But if you had cable, you were probably, probably watching you know, Comedy Central and rather than rather than sure. CNN or whatever. Um, yeah. I think teaching mindfulness and teaching awareness of your emotional reactions to things and also even learning to um, respond rather than, than react sometimes could be a skill that um, could be taught in conjunction with, and I actually try to teach in conjunction with digital literacy so um how we understanding that fake news happens but it also fake news is kind of fed by um emotion 
you know? So it's like, as well as sometimes some of the like conflicts that you see happening on, on social media, that type of thing. So that's something that I think that I want to do more research on and work towards um, bringing mindfulness and emotional literacy with digital literacy because fake news is a huge, huge problem. So our culture right now, and I've seen this a lot, you know, whenever I go back to visit my parents um, in Minnesota, I'm in an area where there's a lot of, um, I see a lot of rhetoric with signs like F your, F your feelings. As well as, you know, I, I see things on social media where people are kind of mocking people as um, weak for having emotions. Sorry, what was that? Snowflakes. Yeah, snowflakes, exactly. So um, so I think that teaching, again, mindfulness, I think is a really powerful um, tool, particularly non-neoliberal versions of mindfulness where you you work with difficult, difficult emotions. You're curious about them. You're curious about what they, kind of the wisdom that they can have in them, including anger towards injustice or sadness about somebody who's suffering. Um, so I think that that at the same time, if you're going to teach students how to work with their emotions differently, you also then need to talk about the rhetoric of emotions um, and how, particularly with um, narratives around masculinity, where like emotions are <laughs> uh, a sign of weakness or, or whatever, or shame. Um, you know, it's going to take more than a unit <laughs> on mindfulness to change some of those narratives about emotions. And where do those happen? Like what, where, like which, if you think about what classes kind of cover rhetorics of emotions, I don't, I don't really, I don't really know. I don't think it's very common, but I think it, it needs to be because it's part of, um, it's part, it's a huge part of how we communicate about things as well as how open we are to other people's ideas. If you're not aware of your own emotions when you're listening to someone who you disagree with, um, or if you come from a place of a lot of privilege and you're listening to stories of people who experience racism or other you know, forms of uh, discrimination or violence, and you're, you're uncomfortable with those, um, you're, you're not, you're going to be uh, resistant towards that and so there's a there's a lot of literature about the kind of a pedagogy of discomfort where it's like teaching people to be with us emotions as a way of growing and learning our, and expanding our perspectives 